Welcome to Demystifying Science, where we are exploring the edge of what is known. A few weeks back, we had Ivor Cat on the show, and he was talking about what he called the glitch, which was a problem he encountered in the early days of computer engineering, when the computers were switching over to digital, and there was an instability which arose that Ivor claimed threatened everything from nuclear missiles to planes and flights. Today on the show, we have Mr. John Dore, who was a development engineer under Ivor Cat at Ferranti at the uh, computer company that was working uh, within the context of this glitch. And Mr. Dore has a slightly different take on the events. And we pride ourselves here at Demystifying Science on getting both sides, all sides, many sides of the story. So if anyone has a different take on the glitch, please reach out to us. We would love to hear it. Uh, Mr. Dore, thank you. Welcome to Demystifying Science. And Tell us how you came to be acquainted with the glitch in the first place. Well, I uh, was appointed in uh, 1961, in July uh, 1961, to work for Ivor Cat as a development engineer. And uh, I, I said uh, at one stage, what happens if the, the clock occurs at the same time as the input? And that uh, triggered uh, Ivor's thoughts. Um, and uh, that was at the end of 1961, to give it a, a date, a, a few months uh, uh, after I'd been there. And, um, and this uh, clock triggering at the same time, that's the, that's the glitch. Maybe you can just summarize the glitch really quickly so that we know. The glitch is really when you try to uh, staticize an input which hasn't settled. Well, uh, that's, so a, lot of, that's you, a lot of terms you, I haven't heard before. Y yes, it's, uh, uh, y you have effectively between latches you have, uh, or staticizers, you have a set of logic which has to settle down then before you go to the next clock, otherwise it's indeterminate. Mm. And if that logic hasn't settled and it drives a number of places, it's even more of a, a mess. So it, it's very simple. You just need the time delay, that's the penalty you pay, by putting in another latch, um, which is, uh, on some computers, the clock is just a regular beat and um uh lo and behold the problem disappears mm. and what is it what is a problem? latch a latch is a staticizer something which remembers the inputs when you clock it so at a particular point of time it remembers the state that's input and then uh it re remembers that and then that feeds on to the next phase of computation the, the computer is full, full of latches. So if it's such a simple time. solution, was, this, was the solution implemented at the time? Or why did Ivor latch onto this glitch problem if it was so easily solved? Well, it, we were producing pro, uh, computers which didn't uh, cause us any uh, distress. So my view is that it was all my fault when I said to him, what happens if the clock happens at the same time as the input? So it was quite extraneous to the um, needs of the company at that time. And so this, is a, this was a, a, a sort of a theoretical problem rather than something that you encountered while developing computers for Ferranti. Correct. And so were the computers at Ferranti already being designed with the glitch being taken into account? Yes, but I haven't gone and looked up the particular circuitry. Right. Um, but uh, it was not a, uh, an extant problem. It, it, it only ari arose because uh, either caused it to arise. And, and then is, on, hmm? on some stuff that he was dealing with, he built in a lot of logic to... Uh, um, compensate for his perceived problem. And so it's something that's basically possible to evoke in a digital system, but it does not appear to be a sort of a significant enough problem to cause World War III. Well, yeah, <laughs> it's, uh, uh, for example, on the Motorola 68000 um, integrated circuit, which was a, a, a small computer chip, uh, they, uh, you would need external latches to feed that. I haven't gone and looked that up. I mean, my uh, recollection is from a long time ago, but a lot of uh, uh, people would um, uh, say, well, this isn't a problem which uh, 
exists and they they would ignore it so um maybe things were designed with uh, with the glitch uh, built in because people just didn't understand that was outside the uh, area of frantic but this i mean if the glitch was something that was common in computer systems you would have been encountering sort of these phantom crashes on a regular basis and it seems like if you're designing a computer system and you're constantly experiencing phantom crashes you would then be required to trace that back to figure out where it's coming from and to fix it it seems it you seems would, hard to imagine so there was nothing to fix right so it just it wasn't it wasn't something that was coming across so it's a it's theoretical an problem pro- it's a, it's a problem which if you uh ran at too high a clock rate you get it, the whole computer would uh, fail because it it would have glitches all over the place mm. and so it, as computers the, have so just by slowing the clock down to uh allow the logic to settle uh you cure the problem so it's a, a question of clock interval the and time s- between successive clocks and in modern computers you know they 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 seem like they I, i don't know a lot about this but they do seem like they run faster than they would have in 1961 so do do you have no, they, a sense they run faster and there are a lot more transistors in it so i i mean you have on some of these computer tri- chips you have billions of transistors which cause not a problem now one of the things uh, i i thought about when i went to the vlsi very large scale integration Uh, um conference at Edinburgh University in 1980 um the um i was going to say something on that um the, oh yes the, the um issue there was how many electrons did you have to have on a um an element in a chip for it to distinguish between one and a, a zero mm. and at that time they said well you need a six electrons so that sets a limit to the amount of miniaturization you can have before you're forced to design parallel computers and that's just based on voltage or something like how you know electron no that's based on charge where, right. which uh, on the um uh, on the chip on a particular element in the chip to this but no one's down there counting the electrons zero. sorry but no one was down there counting the electrons i imagine <laughs> they'd be counted by the function of the chip fair enough you know it, it's either sufficient charge there or not sufficient charge there how do you detect the how do you detect the charge oh you you're uh, um i mean that you're into the business of metal oxide <laughs> silicon technology and so on so and it's like a theoretical design principle where you're like there's this much material here and this is ha- like are you i do do you know like what you're measuring when you're when you're evaluating this sort of this sort of limit is it i guess the question is is it an experimentally determined limit or is it a theoretical limit a good question i i don't know uh, uh how i choose to answer that i think <laughs> it it either works or it doesn't work if you <laughs> if you uh, miniaturize too much then it would cease to work so much engineering so is like it's this it's certainly empirically sorted out if no other way so ivers complaint was that if this glitch was happening and planes were falling out of the sky no one would ever know because the crashes are often undetermined do you think that there's any minute possibility that you know there's no, a couple I mean, submarines there, a buried under are, a glacier somewhere that are you know no thunk due of, to the glitch a lot of planes um Uh, fly by wire which is when you don't have the mechanical link between uh, the various control uh, flaps on the plane um the uh, an air france plane dropped out of the sky and that was because all three piton uh, speed sensors uh, froze at the same time i remember and that the, uh, the um uh, what do you call him the co-pilot pulled back on the um on the uh, uh, stick to make the plane go up and then it uh, didn't have any lift and it mm. dropped at a 10,000 feet a minute Oof. from 40,000 feet bang so Straight in the ocean uh, and that was entirely preventable if this guy hadn't pulled back and he shouldn't have known that 
But it's, he didn't um, know how fast uh, he was going. So That's right. But he, sh- he should not have pulled back at all. I, n- I know from somebody... Stuck his in, hand out the window, maybe? Like, ah, how fast are well, we going? <laughs> sometimes uh, I, I do know a pilot in uh, British Airways, uh, uh, an engineer in British Airways on the flight deck, and he suddenly realized the plane was going too slow, and he leapt forward and pushed the sticks forward to hmm. uh, put on more power. Otherwise, that plane would have dropped out of the sky. So, How did he know, though? Did he have sensors, or he just got the I, sensation? I, I can't recall how hmm. he said it. But, um, uh, what, it is fascinating, though, that a lot of the instabilities in aerospace at this point, like a lot of the crashes really do come down to computer problems. It seems well, like... Do I? Do they? I think so. Uh, I mean, it's I always mean, a combination of like 20 different things, um, right? Shiloh has watched the reenactment of every plane crash that has ever happened. So this is a man that I would be cautious. I think the series is called Mayday or something like that. I think well, it's you, called like Aircraft Disasters. Mentor, the, the Boeing uh, captain who analyzes these things on the uh, on YouTube. No, I should probably. Yeah, Actually, yeah. I swore off this because it was really ruining my in-flight experience. <laughs> he stopped I just, flying. I couldn't enjoy yeah. flying anymore after I started studying all these things, so. I had to stop. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I met somebody recently and he said, uh, oh, I said, where did you fly? And uh, anyway, the long and short of it is he'd lost all his friends. They'd all dropped out of the sky. Oh, oh my. no. Um, and remember that when they were searching for this guy who went around the world or uh, tried to circumnavigate in a balloon, he got lost in the Nevada desert, didn't he, or the Mojave desert. Huh. And in searching for him, they found about 12, uh, 1,200 planes before they found him. So, because in the canyons, you get uh, uh, turbulence and so on. It's not predictable. But, um, um, there's but definitely you, a lot. But, a but lot I feel of, like those are probably not necessarily computerized planes, right? Like the little Cessnas. Do they, I, I figured that that was all analog. Yeah, it probably is. Yes. Right, so that's like yes, so I've the glitch is not causing it. Cessnas to come to come out of the sky. They're, no, and uh, uh, a lot of these planes are fly by wire, and some planes have not just two systems checking one another, but uh, f- up to five. Mm. Um, so, and that's um, also solved you, by if, just having a la- by by having a latch between the the different computers when they because that was something that um that Ivor mentioned where he was like, look, if you have multiple computers that are trying to speak to each other, and they're all talking yes. at the same time, that there could be something catastrophic that happens there. That's right, but uh, you don't usually fire off a nuclear weapon just on the basis that you've just had these two things come like that. You, people have to unlock a safe, get the. Uh, read the instructions and, <laughs> you know, it's, it's a longer process. Now, if you want to be sure, you program in a particular language on a different microcomputer or whatever uh, and the, have the program written by a different team and you, you can compare, say, two or three uh, such um, efforts and you've got time to do it. So uh, it, you're not into the glitch situation. There's, there's no question that these things come in and you're going to make the decision to fire a nuclear weapon just like that. Hmm. Well, that's a relief. It did come awful close, though, a few times from what I understand. But that might have been more human error. There was um, uh, an explosion at Three Mile Island, wasn't there? Mm-hmm. Now, whether that was due to a glitch, I think I mm. claims that as a glitch, but... Uh, well, that's the nice thing about having now. something that's totally untraceable, right? Because if if the glitch is what causes all of these problems, how would you ever know? Well, right? exactly. Mm. But so, it doesn't. We managed to produce successful computers and uh, uh, systems which work. Proof is you know, in the pudding. Uh, it, it, I, I've no doubt if you. I mean, either seems to have made a. A, a journey to establishments to uh, query these things. But uh, uh, I mean, there's no doubt bad design, which is unearthed in one or two places. So uh, um, all credit to him. You know, he's a smart cookie. Um, but so- along those lines, there were, from what we understand, at least one or two conferences to discuss this glitch. What do you make of that? Well, it's... Uh, uh, 
day out for the boys, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I think, uh, yeah, the, uh, I mean, he said that Dijkstra um, uh, had noted his work and uh, uh, he, he did write a good paper, the, perhaps the only one uh, on this subject. So, um, uh, and he deserves credit for that, certainly. Um, but uh, I don't see it as the all encompassing difficulty which he views it to be. All right. Well, now, and I mean... then he went off. He went off and did this uh, cat spiral. Now, um, this cat spiral was really se a serial storage mechanism where he would go and check each uh, chip, each uh, uh, storage element bit by bit to produce a, uh, a working spiral. I mean, there would be classes of error on a, a wafer scale um, integration, which was his passion on that. Uh, classes of error, for example, if there was a a, a, um, a complete circle floor so that somebody couldn't get through that, it would it would uh, cause the, an inability to court to um, find a spiral. Um, we did not get into the spiral, unfortunately. We we talked about maybe doing a separate podcast for that. Right, yeah. right, but. I but you see, it... on big computers, we had uh, error detection and correction. The chips were known to be unreliable to, due to a processing um, infelicity. Uh, they weren't as uh, they should have been. So um, the, uh, there's error detection and correction on these machines. You don't rely upon their being 100% uh, correct. So, And there are codes uh, more... Um, uh, effective than Richard Hammond's code, although Richard Hammond's code is uh, a nice, easily understood, elegant thing. It, it is, uh, you can do better. And the Hammond code is uh, for error correction. Hmm? And the, the, the Hammond codes are for uh, error correction inside of these computer systems, basically. Yes, yes. In, that, in, in this case, it's uh, storage, and the storage chips were not were not um, up to the specification. So they weren't as reliable as they should have been. And so, I, I think that on some level, that's kind of the history of computing, which is the fact that bugs have always been a thing to deal with and the hardware is not always up to the task. And so you have to basically have- Isn't this the history it. of engineering in general? It's the history of engineering in general. And so it's, it, it makes a lot of sense that there would be checks and balances and processes by which to work with hardware that is theoretically ideal but practically imperfect well yes you have ranges of uh, numbers which you expect at different stages of computation um, and you can use more or less uh, um, better languages for example the um, air traffic control in europe euro control is uh, done in the language ada ADA after Lady Ada Lovelace, the first programmer, um, and uh, the uh, the only reason that people go out, I think, and do C and C plus plus is because it's student driven rather than um, what they should really be doing. So, hmm. I, I, and it is very easy to write errors in code in uh, the C language, and it's. Uh, um, successors, hmm. but uh, this does not happen with uh, with Ada. Effectively, once you get it to compile, it is more likely than not to run and run correctly. Hmm. And there's, in any case, another language beyond that called Spark, S-P-A-R-C, which is um, uh, for uh, mission critical software. And that's even even less error prone. That's for running the plane, or correct. I see. Yeah. Cool. I mean, I think that that covers... So basically what it comes down to is the fact that the glitch, though a theoretical problem, is not the bear that Ivor Cat made it out to be because there have been both theoretical and practical corrections to the problems that it poses. Um, if somebody has perspectives that run contrary to what Mr. Dore has, has laid before us, please reach out. But it seems like this might be a case where we have... We have covered more than one side of the topic. 
And so thank you, yes. Mr. Dory, for joining us. No, it's been great. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye then. Bye. Bye.